For details of our complete range of podcasts and our terms of use, go to bbcworldservice.com slash podcasts. This year on the 19th of March, a 27-year-old woman was brutally murdered in Afghanistan. Beaten to death in broad daylight in the middle of Kabul by a mob while hundreds of people looked on, filming her murder on their mobile phones. Farhunda Malekzada was stamped on, thrown off a roof, run over by a car, and finally set on fire. I am Zarghuna Kargar, and the killing of Farhunda is the harrowing subject of today's documentary here on the BBC World Service. I'm an Afghan woman myself and an activist in women's issues. So it's a story that broke my heart. For the very first time, we have spoken to the family of one of the men in prison for her murder and to Farhonda's own family. But be warned, this is a highly disturbing story. رفتم که یکی زیاد سوخته بود که خونه هم آمده بود یه شخص تکه تکه کردن تکه تکه شوار I went to see her I saw her face all burned it had bled her hair was all pulled out she was just ashes and charcoal how could they do this to a human being to a living thing they should have stopped to think that is Farhunda's mother, Bibi Hajira, talking to the BBC. She was my fourth child. It was in Kabul that she was born, on a Friday, our day of worship. I really like the name Farhunda because it means prosperous and eternal. I used to sit next to her and gently touch her face. Her face was beautiful and so soft. I would tell her, even just one of your eyes, my child, could buy the world. I would tell her how soft her face was. She used to say, Mother, I hope my luck is beautiful too, and my heart. The story of the killing of Farhunda begins just before Afghan New Year. It is a major holiday in the calendar. Farhunda, who still lived with her parents, left home to go to a Qur'an reciting class. She had been helping her mother prepare for the New Year festivities. Everything was normal, so normal. It was just like any other day when she would say goodbye and leave for her class. Farhonda was happy. She said, goodbye, mother, I'm off. She kissed her nephew. She said, goodbye, father. The holiday had already started for some people in Afghanistan. Just down the road from the Shahidu Shamshira Mosque in the center of town, a young man called Yaqub was helping out in his uncle's shop. It was his after-school job. <laughs> My dear Yaqub was a very good boy, says his mother. He was good to everyone. <laughs> he liked to play football and practice boxing, adds his father, Muhammad Yasin. He's 16, just turning 17. He was in year 11 at school, and sometimes he worked for his uncle in the shop. He was off school for winter holidays. On the day of the incident, it was also my niece's engagement party, so we were all going there to celebrate. Yaqub had said, Father, you go along, and I'll join you in the evening at my aunt's house. Around lunchtime, Farhunda also found herself in the center of Kabul. She had decided to take a detour on her way home to visit a shrine at the Shahid Shamshira Mosque. It's a crowded place, and in my experience, very uneasy for women to walk free. Men stare at you. The street sellers here might even try to molest you, and beggars loiter. Whenever I am back in Kabul, I tend to avoid this area. But Farhonda 
wearing a black hijab but also blue jeans, said her prayers here. And then she got talking to a caretaker at the shrine who was selling charms. These little pieces of paper bearing Quranic verses are believed to hold magical power. Farkhunda disapproved of the custom. She considered it an Islamic. It is thought she was trying to persuade the caretaker to stop selling the charms. Clearly, he was unimpressed because suddenly he began to shout, this woman is an American and she has burned the Quran. It was an explosive accusation and an angry crowd quickly gathered. Farkhunda, filmed by a bystander, tried to explain what had happened. She pleads her innocence to three men who ask her why she burned the book that Muslims believe contains the received words of God. She says, I did not burn the Holy Quran. The Americans have sent her, says one man. And Farkhunda replies, don't call me an American. If you say anything, he answers, I will smash your mouth. <laughs> then the onslaught begins. Farkhunda is dragged out by a mob of furious men and kicked repeatedly. <laughs> Kill her, they scream. Nearby policemen try to disperse the crowd by firing their guns into the air. Farkhunda is on the ground. A man and a woman move her away from the mob to the inner courtyard of the shrine. What happens next to Farkhunda is documented in distressing details, videoed on the mobile phones of the growing crowd that stood and watched her fate. First, the mob storms the shrine. The police try to push the attackers away from Farkhunda. In the disturbing footage, Farkhunda is pulled up to the rooftop. And then, the mob throw her to the ground, where others descend on her. The men beat her savagely with pieces of wood. You can clearly hear them hitting her. They stamp on her as she lies defenseless on the ground. She tries to defend herself, but the onslaught continues. The video pictures show her, by now drenched in blood, pleading for mercy but she has none. The police also look on. Someone shouts, is she dead? Perhaps by now she is. Still, the mob haven't finished with Farkhunda. Now they use a car to run her over. Before dragging her down the street some 200 meters and dumping her body in front of the shop where Yaqub is working that day. Yaqub runs out to find out what the commotion is, and he joins in, punching Farkhunda as others carry on kicking and stamping on her. The men throw Farkhunda onto the dry bed of the Kabul River, and Yaqub joins others to stone her with huge slabs of rock. Finally, they set her on fire. Farkhunda's family were waiting for her to come home to celebrate New Year. Although the news of the incident reached them later, they still didn't know the extent of the horror. Her father, Muhammad Nadir, explains. <laughs> It was around 4 or 4.30 p.m. I got a phone call from Farkhunda's mobile. I said, who are you? And the caller said, I am working with the police. Here is a woman who is in trouble at the Shahid Shamshira shrine. I think she is related to you. I said, yes, this is my daughter's number you have called me from. He said, well, you need to go to the Shahid Shamshira shrine. So her brother, her mother and myself 
we all went to the shrine. There was huge crowd and police. They took us to the police station to question us. They said, your daughter is alive and she is here. So you need to come here so we can investigate. They told us to say she is mentally ill. They said, say she is mentally ill, otherwise you will have problems. Under pressure from the police, the family agreed to go on television and say publicly that Farhonda was mentally ill. After that, they said, your daughter is dead. Come and take her corpse away. The authorities then advised the entire family to leave Kabul for their own safety. Meanwhile, news of the killing spread quickly. Those who had videoed the murder uploaded the footage to social media for all to see, some of them bragging of their involvement. One of them, Sharaf Baghlani, posted this on his Facebook page. Salam. Today at 4 p.m. an atheist woman burned the Quran at the Shah Dushamshira shrine. Afterwards, the religious people of Kabul, including myself, killed her. Hell shall be her place. Afghanistan's president, Ashraf Ghani, strongly condemned the attack. Yet other officials, including the spokesman for the Kabul police, a female deputy minister and a prominent politician, endorsed it. Dr. Zalmai Zabuli, a senior member of the parliament, posted this on his Facebook, alongside a picture of Farhonda. This is the horrible and hated person who was punished by our Muslim compatriots today for what she did. Thus, they proved to her masters that Afghans want only Islam and cannot tolerate imperialism, apostasy and spies. She was given the punishment she deserved. <laughs> That first night, other activists didn't want to join us. Only four or five of us went out, and we lit candles. That is Sahra Musavi, a women's rights advocate based in Kabul. The next day, she and a few other women's rights activists tried to organize a vigil for Farhonda. But amid high public feelings, they were met with reluctance from other civil society groups. They said, you want to kill yourselves? There are other ways to do that. People are feeling extremely violent. It's the first night after Farhonda's murder, and she burned the Quran. It has been proven. It still wasn't clear at that point what had happened. Earlier that day, though some had condemned it, a number of imams endorsed Farhonda's murder in their Friday sermons. Little wonder then, the killers seemed to think they could commit such a heinous crime with impunity. But they were wrong. The police did begin investigations immediately. Yaqub was one of those arrested. His father spent the day after Farhonda's murder going from one police station to another, trying to find his son. It was 10.30 the next day that my nephew called and said, Yaqub has been taken. We quickly got up and went to the police station to find out what happened. We went from one police station to another, but we couldn't find him. Eventually, Yaqub turned up on television, admitting he had taken part. Yaqub's mother is still coming to terms with the reality of her son's behavior. <laughs> I felt awful, very upset, so upset that I can't describe it. It was a shock for me, believe me. I still haven't recovered. God knows when I will. Why would my child do this? Everyone is asking why this happened to such a good boy. Everyone. The neighbors loved him. The day after Farhonda's murder, in the evening, the authorities announced that Farhonda had not, in fact, burned the Quran, and they conceded she was not mentally ill. A day after that, they announced that she was innocent. The officials who had endorsed her lynching, some of whom were sacked, retracted their comments, as did the imams. The religious elite condemned her killing. Farhonda's family now returned home to bury their daughter. Her mother watched the videos of her death and saw the full extent of the horror. 
در من بدرد میره کمی لازی که فرخون من تو شیش دارم افسر رشون میره پولیس ای تو چور دور شستاد است هیچی نو تو سهل داره کسی نمیگه What pains my heart is when she is sitting and her head is bleeding. The police are just standing there and watching. They don't say anything. Why? Why don't they bring a car over or call a policewoman? I see the crowd go through the shrine and pull her hair to bring her out. That is what really tortures me. She was alive then. Her face was covered in blood. And after all the pain and suffering she's going through, a man stamps on her and she stands up again and they beat her and she still stands up, but she can't see the attackers behind her. We went to the morgue. I opened the plastic bag with the zip. I said, Farhonda, my child. I spoke to her and cleaned her face and hands. Her hands and feet were burned and bruised all over. Her face was burned all over. I said, why did they do this to you, my girl? And I felt that she was saying to me, I don't know, mother, I was innocent, but those cruel people did this to me. Three days after the murder, more than a thousand people gathered for Farhunda's funeral. As Sahra Musavi recalls, the feelings of women there were running high. When we went there that day, my friends and I, we promised each other we will not let any man touch this coffin. We won't let it happen. Men would come forward to carry the coffin, and we said, don't touch it. Where were you that day when 150 men attacked Farhonda? It didn't matter to us that these men were not those men. In our opinion, all men were those men. Then we took the coffin to the place where the prayers were to be said. There, our father gave us his permission. Our father said, these are my daughters who are calling for justice for Farhonda. Let them carry the coffin. The carrying of the coffin by women was unprecedented in Afghanistan. It wasn't a coffin. We were carrying a hero. We are all Farhonda, they chanted, their voices growing stronger and louder. It was an extraordinary moment, but it was just the start. In the days after Farhonda's murder, Protesters filled the streets of Kabul in their thousands, demanding justice and an end to violence against women. Some of the women marched with their faces painted red in memory of Farhonda's bloodied image. As Farhonda started to become an icon for activists, we learned more about who she was. And the revelations turned out to be bitterly ironic. Far from being an unbeliever who had burned the Quran, she was in fact a deeply religious woman. Indeed, Farhunda was a student of Islamic law. She would say, when I have finished my Islamic law studies, I want to become a judge. I want to work for justice. She said, please mother, buy me a bookshelf this year. And her father said, I will buy it for you, my child. She said, I love my books more than anything else. Yaqub's parents had plans for him too. I was planning to buy him a new rucksack for school, says his mother. I am so upset he won't be going to school this year. Yaqub was charged with murder and disrespecting a corpse. His parents condemned what happened, but they argued their son was only 16 at the time of the murder. 
in other words, a minor, and that he had only got involved after Farkhunda had been killed. Here is his father again. To kill someone like that was not right. If the people thought she had burned the Quran, then it should have been the job of the police to arrest her and find out what was going on. Fair enough, but my son is just a child, 16 years old. Okay, he disrespected a corpse. He got carried away by his religious fervor, his youthful passion. But it wasn't just him, there were a thousand people there. A thousand people saying one thing. Who was to say at the time that a thousand people were lying and the one on the ground was telling the truth? Yaqub is one of 49 men charged in connection with the murder. 19 of them are policemen who were on duty that day. Six weeks after Farkhunda's murder, the trials began. Activists hoped this would be a defining moment for Afghanistan, upholding the rule of law and doing it with transparency. The full proceedings were broadcast live on television. Within days, the verdicts came. 26 of the accused were acquitted. 11 police officers were sentenced to a year in prison for their failure to protect Farkhunda. Eight civilians were given 16 years in prison and four death sentences were handed down, including to the charm seller who had instigated the attack on Farkhunda and to the despair of his parents, to Yaqub. <laughs> I was devastated, devastated. My boy, how could a 16-year-old be judged like this? Why should he be executed? The silly boy didn't kill her. He just threw a stone at her corpse. Why should he be judged like this? I am upset for Farkhunda's mother, continues Yaqub's mother. But Yaqub's mother wants her own boy to be spared punishment. In response, Farkhunda's mother says she only wants justice. What kind of human beings were they? They weren't human. They were just like wild wolves. They beat her and killed her. Wasn't that enough? Why did they have to drag her down the street and run her over with a car? Why did they have to burn her? They didn't even leave her dead body intact. The street beside the shrine where they lynched and murdered Farkhunda has now been named after her. On the riverbed where they set her on fire, there is a memorial to her. She's been given the status of martyr in Afghanistan, an honor usually only given to fallen soldiers. But has this horrific killing and the reaction to it changed anything? Activist Sahra Musavi thinks not. When the women carried Farkhunda's coffin, this was something new and significant moment in Afghanistan's history. But nothing has changed. No law has been introduced to prevent violence against women. We have to keep fighting to improve things, because in the end, this country has to be better than this. The young people who killed Farkhunda were only five or six years old at the beginning of the Karzai government. Now they are young men. They were wearing modern clothes, very good clothes, but their attitudes are still outdated. Respect for the law in our society doesn't exist. Respect for each other doesn't exist. Several of Farkhunda's principal killers were never arrested. They were identified from the footage, but they are still at large. For her parents, the nightmare goes on. Farkhunda is alive. Her name is alive. I am proud of her. But it's Farkhunda who suffered the pain, the torture. I want them to catch the four murderers who did this. I want justice. And I want every person who laid a finger on her to be punished. We just want justice. Not revenge, only justice. There isn't a moment without the pain of losing Farkhunda. There will never be another Farkhunda.
In early July, the four death sentences handed down to four of Farhonda's attackers were quashed by the appeals court. Three of the men were given 20 years in prison instead. Yaqub's death sentence was reduced to 10 years. Eleven of the police officers were freed on bail. All the cases have been referred to the High Court. Meanwhile, several of Farhonda's principal killers are still at large, and Farhonda's family now live under 24-hour guard, fearing for their safety. Farhonda was a woman who dared. She spoke out when she saw something wrong, and she paid for it with her life in the most brutal way. Yet her murder has destroyed other lives too, those of her family, of course, but also the families and dependents of those who carried out the atrocity. Many of them are poor and ill-educated. Their chances in life will now be even less. Afghan women are more ready than ever to build a just society and combat violence. But until they are joined in this endeavor by the majority of men, the danger is that the killing of Farhonda will not be the last such death. That's all from today's documentary, The Killing of Farhonda, and from me, Zarghuna Kargar. To hear more documentaries from the BBC, go to bbcworldservice.com forward slash documentaries. There are dozens of different podcasts now available from the BBC, including news, documentaries, science, business, arts and sports. For details of them all, go to bbcworldservice.com slash podcasts. <laughs>